about her senior lecturer. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Um, this is what we'll, we'll go about talking about this today. We'll talk about uh, mass incarceration and social implications. We'll talk about uh, Correctional Health Services, or CHS, which is part of NYCHHC. And we'll talk about health. But let's start here. <clears throat> uh, Lila Watson is a, an indigenous Australian, or a Murray. Uh, she's of the Aboriginal Australians of Queensland. Uh, she's a visual artist, an activist, and an academic. And uh, Lord knows what we've done the world over at the life expense of uh, indigenous peoples. And she says, if you have come here to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Uh, in full disclosure, so no one uh, wonders how I really feel about this, um, incarceration makes no sense. Uh, the two things it's supposed to fulfill, which is to make society safer, it doesn't do and to rehabilitate the incarcerated, which it also does not achieve. Um, more jail and more prison does not equal greater public safety. And um, the rates of folks who are in jail or prison returning is approximately 70% in three years, most coming back in the first year. Most people entering the criminal justice system have substance abuse is issues. Uh, the mental health is often compromised long before they become incarcerated. And most have suffered trauma in the incarceration literature, uh, you hear the phrase a lot, the near ubiquity of trauma across incarcerated populations. US jails and prisons are not safe places to be, but we have chosen incarceration instead of drug courts and rehab, instead of mental health treatment, parole and probation, sex offender treatment, restorative justice, community service, halfway houses, fines and restitution, house arrest, and boot camp. Um, incarceration is not only helpful, but it's also harmful. It harms health. And so if you're a physician who cares about the health of a society, then it's certainly something to care about. <clears throat> there are approximately 2.3 million people incarcerated in the United States of America. This is like um, you know, a slice at once uh, figure. Um, this includes uh, jail and prison. So the difference is, generally speaking, prison is when a person has been sentenced to more than a year. Jail is when either a person is sentenced to a year or less, or the vast majority of people in jails, which are more operated at local levels as opposed to prisons, which are operated at state and federal levels. In, in jail, uh, the vast majority of people um, are awaiting trial, awaiting sentencing, or just can't afford bail. Um, so that's the difference between uh, jail and prison. But there, it's estimated there are 11 million people who move through the jail and prison system in the US every year. <clears throat> the US population makes up approximately 4.3% of the world's population. We have approximately 25% of the world's incarcerated. No other country locks up more of its citizens. And so of course this begs the question if the United States is liberty loving or if the United States is liberty deprivation loving. And as it turns out, uh, a lot of that depends upon the circumstances you're born into. Including prison, jail, probation, and parole, about 7 million US adults are under correctional supervision. Um, the difference in probation and parole is probation is uh, basically a conditional release under supervision uh, so that a person does not become incarcerated. And parole is kind of like a version of probation where a person has served time, and then they're released under supervision and conditional uh, circumstances. So how this got to uh, where it is, is is obviously a long and complicated process, but there are predominantly three um, political moves which were made to bring about this, this prison boom in the 1980s and 1990s um, uh, to fill our jails and prisons and for it to be called mass incarceration. One is that in 1971, Nixon declared a quote unquote war on drugs. He says that drug abuse is public enemy number one. He vows a reduction of the illegal drug trade he gives $500 million a year to Colombia to combat, quote unquote, guerrilla groups involved in the illegal drug trade. And this leads to more arrests and more incarceration in the US. In 1984, Reagan, as part of a comprehensive crime control act, which was the first revision of the US criminal code since the early 1900s, um, has, has it within it something called the SRA, the Sentencing Reform Act, wherein the US Sentencing Commission uh, 
calls for a quote-unquote increase in the consistency in sentencing, federal parole is abolished, and uh, this leads also to increased penalties for the cultivation, possession, and transfer of marijuana and other substances such as heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine. Uh, part of this is also the Just Say No campaign. Nancy Reagan, Just Say No to Drugs. And we all know how successful that was. If you don't know how successful that was, it wasn't successful. <laughs> <clears throat> In 1994, Bill Clinton uh, signs the largest crime bill in the history of the United States, the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, or the Crime Bill of 1994. It places 100,000 new police officers on the street. It gives more than $10 billion in funding for prisons to build new prisons as well. It expands the death penalty. Here we also have the elimination of higher education for inmates. And here we have the three strikes law, which uh, says that if you have a violent felony and two other previous convictions, it's basically a mandated uh, serving of a life sentence. There are hundreds of thousands of people still in, in uh, prisons across the US as a result of this three strikes law. When uh, Hillary was campaigning in 2016 and thereabout, she said that it was a mistake. Um, so mass incarceration defined, we're no longer incarcerating the individual, we're incarcerating whole entire social groups. Um, black African American people in the United States of America, particularly black males, have extraordinarily high rates of exposure to the criminal justice system. Uh, the rates are often given in terms of 100,000 people per year. Uh, overall in the US, it's approximately 700, 700 per 100,000 people per year. Um, he, here we see for Latinos, it's uh, almost 1,000. And for black Americans, it's 2,200. Put another way, if you change the denominator here, for you US all in, it's about 700 per 100,000. You, as you can see, we're right there next to Russia and Cuba, who we love so much, our buddies. Um, if you change the denominator for black Americans, it's 2,200, which is what we saw on the last slide. And if you change the denominator for black American males, it's more than 4,300, 100,000 per year. Put another way, if you combine the entire prison populations of all of India, Argentina, Lebanon, Canada, Japan, Germany, Finland, Israel, and England, you will just about make the number of black males who are incarcerated in the United States of America. And put yet another way, if you are born black and male in the US, there's a one in three chance you will be incarcerated. If you're born black and male and poor in the United States, the number increases. And it more than doubles if you are black, male, less than 35 years of age, and a high school dropout. There's a 68% incarceration rate in that population, and it has become a normal life event. Uh, but the US has chosen the response of the deprivation of liberty to respond to the problem of crime, rather than a number of rehabilitation efforts. And in the words of Bruce Western, who's a sociologist who studies mass incarceration in the US, he says, we have chosen the deprivation of liberty for an historically aggrieved group whose liberty in the United States was never firmly established to begin with. And so in a certain regard, the impact of slavery days continues. Uh, it's estimated that one in nine African-American children have a parent who's incarcerated. That's almost 1.2 million children. Uh, the physical, psychological, and emotional negative effects, uh, including schooling, acting out, depression, behavioral disturbance, thought to affect boys more than girls, um, lead us to to question and presents us with the idea of uh, incarceration as an inherited trait and as a health risk. So the New York City jail system pretty much follows suit. The New York City jail system is made of Rikers Island as well as three borough jails, one in the Bronx, one in Manhattan, and one in Brooklyn. Um, and if you'll see here, uh, with uh, black and Latino combined, it's about 90%, uh, despite the fact that population-wise in New York City, um, black and African American people make up approximately 26% of the population and for Latino that's 29%. Um, again, more than 75% um, of this group here uh, is, ha has been found guilty of no crime, um, either awaiting trial, awaiting sentencing, or simply uh, cannot afford bail. <clears throat> and so here we have Rikers Island, which is an international symbol of damage and despair right there between the Bronx and Queens. Um, there's no bridge here on this uh, map. It started in 1932 and used to only be able to get there by ferry. In the 1960s, a bridge was built. That's still the bridge that's being used. Um, I would also just like to point out as a kind of cruel joke here, 
the proximity of LaGuardia Airport. When you're on Rikers Island, you hear planes taking off and landing all day long, all day. So um, the injustices, Rikers Island is supposed to close in 2026. That's what de Blasio said. I'm hoping that's really the case. Um, the injustices have really been uh, talked about and put down in writing time and time and time again. The racial and economic disparities, which I've already mentioned, the inhumane conditions, such as a culture of violence, a culture of hyper-confrontation, the facilities which are outdated, uh, in which makeshift weapons are made all the time from radiators, from fans, uh, from ventilation grates, from the lights. Um, the discomfort that when it's hot, there's no AC, and when it's cold, there's no heat, as well as very little programming. What to speak of the isolation involved in, uh, for both the incarcerated person who's on Rikers Island, but also for families and communities trying to get to them. When I was going, it took me 2.5 hours in each direction to get there. So I'd take the two or the five from Brooklyn to the F in Manhattan, took the F from, uh, the, from Manhattan to Queens, the 21st Queensbridge stop. Then I took the M100 bus to sort of the threshold of Rikers. Then once you're on Rikers, there's a route bus. There are route buses that take you. So that journey took me 2.5 hours in each direction. So there's this uh, huge isolation factor as well. As well as the courts, the courts are in the boroughs. So there's a, a huge burden to get uh, people into the courts so they get a court date. As well as the lawyers are not able to meet with the people that they're, they're supposed to defend. Um, as well as this, this uh, isolation from good social services and medical providers, hopefully that's changing. But um, there's also a profound disturbance of mental health on Rikers Island. Uh, one woman that I took care of in the women's facilities facility told me that if you're not crazy before you get there, you'll be crazy very shortly thereafter. And as well as increasing costs. Um, nationally, state and federal wise, it's estimated depending on the state you're in that the cost uh, per incarcerated person per year is anywhere from $30,000 to $70,000. Jails, however, that number goes up a lot because there are a lot more moving parts because again, jail is less than a year and most people uh, you know, are not sentenced. And so on Rikers uh, particularly, it's estimated to be $240,000 per person per year. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully, hopefully that will change. Uh, so the health risks of jail are death, physical injury and violence, sexual assault, solitary confinement, serious mental illness, a compromise of human rights, and no transparency. I list no transparency as a health risk of jail because um, the fact that we do not see the incarcerated is very purposeful. Um, the system is designed that way so that we don't see incarcerated people. And any time you can't see a group of people, there's an inherent health risk involved in that. Um, okay, so here we have where approximately 7,000 incarcerated people live daily. <clears throat> The Perry Center is kind of like the threshold on Rikers. Um, EMTC that you see there, that is the facility if you are sentenced to a year or less. Um, those are the people who are there have on dark green as opposed to in every other facility that have beige, you know, because you have to make sure you know who you're talking to. Um, the NIC is the infirmary. So this is the men's infirmary. This is where folks go, um, for example, who are on dialysis, who need CPAP or BiPAP, who are on IV antibiotics. Um, there's also at the NIC uh, uh, specifically uh, uh, an HIV uh, floor for people who are uh, in active treatment. Um, the West facility is where Urgy Care is. It's staffed by um, it's staffed by emergency physicians. It's kind of like an urgent care. They deal with a lot of um, reduction, splinting, uh, casting, uh, staples and sutures, things like that. Also, medical isolation is at the West facility. For example, if you're being ruled out for TB. Um, RMSC is the women's facility. They kind of have everything on their own there, uh, like an infirmary and uh, x-rays, stuff like that. And AMKC is sort of the belly of the beast. AMKC is the largest men's facility on the island. And it is a place of um, utter chaos. And um, the first time I ever went uh, to, to the medical clinic to work and I went to AMKC, is the first time that the inhumanity of uh, incarceration hit me. Because as you go into the area of medical intake and uh, the medical clinic, you pass on your left really these rows of pens. There's really no other way to uh, describe it. Of young men just waiting, who have been waiting since the time of arrest for hours and hours and hours, and have not been placed in a facility yet, but need their medical intake before they, they get that done. 
Okay, so here we have the other three facilities in the New York City jail system. You have VCBC in the Bronx, which is a barge, actually. It was where we love incarceration in the United States so much. We had New Orleans, of all places, build us a barge down there that we floated up here just to incarcerate people in it. It's five floors. It's 100 single cells, as well as dorms. Um, MDC, also known as the Tombs, uh, is, is in Manhattan on White and Center. It's approximately 800 cells. And then uh, BKDC is in Brooklyn. I spent a good amount of time there on Atlantic and Smith, uh, built in 1957, also 800 single cells. Um, it's just of note how, how, how uh, it's geographically, it's in a lot of our stomping grounds. And so since I've been there, it's just, you know, we get our croissant and coffee <laughs> and pass here all the time. And it's just, um, you know, there are near 800 young men there dying slow deaths of injustice. It's just, has, uh, it's given me a different perspective um, on the neighborhood itself. So incarceration harms health. The harms fall disproportionately on communities of color and those living in poverty. Um, it harms the health of the incarcerated and also undermines the health of families and communities. And within the context of the patient provider relationship, um, you know, we talk about social determinants and we educate ourselves to know all of the things that are contributing to someone's health process. And you don't realize it really hits home. You don't realize you're sitting in, in, within one of these facilities trying to take care of a patient that um, the first thing in your heart and mind again and again that comes up is we have to get you out of here. The right of access to health care in U.S. jails and prisons um, came down from a, a U.S. Supreme Court decision. It was Dr. It, it was, um, Thurgood Marshall, 1976. Mr. Gamble was incarcerated in Texas Department of Corrections. In 1973, a 600-pound bale of hay fell on him while he was working as an incarcerated person. He received inadequate and sporadic medical care. He refused to work. He was punished because he refused to work, so he was placed in solitary confinement. From solitary confinement, he uh, submitted a handwritten lawsuit saying his constitutional rights were violated. It had several dismissals at the local and regional level. It eventually made it to the U.S. Supreme Court. Interestingly enough, the attorney who took it to the U.S. Supreme Court never met Mr. Gamble himself, but he thought he had enough to work with. And in 1976, the Supreme Court ruled in his favor, saying that a denial of medical care for the incarcerated constitutes a deliberate indifference and meets the burden of cruel and unusual punishment, which is prohibited by the Eighth Amendment. Um, how I came to this myself, oh, just, just to go back a minute, it's very interesting and paradoxical that because of that decision, uh, the incarcerated are the only people in the United States of America with a constitutional right to health care. What it's worth. Isn't that crazy? It's insane. It's insane. Um, so how I first came to the concept of jail health and prison health was like anything in life that you come to, it kind of happens gradually. Um, you know, a portal gets opened in your mind, and then you start thinking about it, and then you can't stop thinking about it. But um, this article, which is a wonderful, wonderful article in The New Yorker last year, it's very long, but it's very good. It, it kind of goes into what I won't have time to go into here today, which is very specific and detailed cases of individuals in which the jail and prison healthcare system has failed them, um, leading to deaths and morbidity and mortality. Um, but the point that the article makes, which is wonderful, is that... Uh, the majority of U.S. jails and prisons have um, private for-profit corporations uh, taking care of health, quote unquote delivering health care, which has not resulted in health or care. Um, and so um, in the article, the article makes the argument that the health care of incarcerated people should be designated to an independent body, like a public health body or at the very least a not-for-profit, and staffed with providers who care for the general population, not just incarcerated folks, but for the community. And so in this article, the director of the ACLU National Prison Project says, we believe that incarceration is a uniquely governmental function that should never be contracted out to private for-profit corporations. When you combine the profit motive with limited oversight and an unpopular, politically powerless group like prisoners, it's a recipe for bad outcomes. Um, and so I'm really proud to say that the article itself lists a couple of uh, local facilities, uh, one in Texas, one in Georgia, one in New Jersey. Um, I'm proud to say in Chicago, also Cook County Health has, has in 2018, taken over the, uh, taken care of the incarcerated population there. And 2016, uh, prior to 2016, for the, the health 
again, quote unquote health, in New York City jails, um, it was this private group called Horizon who was actually mentioned a lot in that article that I had just um, talked about, which is a, a for-profit corporation. But in 2016, uh, New York City Health and Hospitals uh, took over, thank God, and, and now it's in the hands of Correctional Health Services. Um, and also, I just, I have to mention, because it takes a village like anything, and there are a lot of people who helped me get there, and Miss Stephanie Lane, Miss Stephanie Lane, Miss Stephanie Lane, I can't say her name or not. I first mentioned it to her, she said, you gotta talk to John Riggins' dad. So I talked to John Riggins, and talked to John Riggins' dad, who's awesome. He put me in touch, John Riggins' dad is awesome, no one knows that. Um, he put me in touch with this guy named Ross McDonald, who I talked to on his cell phone. Thank God I didn't know at the time that Ross McDonald is the chief medical officer of Correctional Health Services in New York City Health and Hospitals. So I was just like talking to him about something I wanted to do. Um, in the meantime, Noah Berlin, thank you, Noah, gave me a book, which is awesome, called Life and Death in Rikers Island that has to do with the, the uh, healthcare progression at Rikers Island. Um, they all got me in touch with this guy named uh, James Grigg, who's a jail physician and who was one of my preceptors while I was there, who's awesome, as well as his team, uh, Vanessa Mitchell, Dr. Winters, who's a great ID doc who I worked with a lot, and Dr. Vessel, who was primarily at the women's facility. Um, as well as Dr. Smith and Dr. Hassel, who put up with me and signed everything they had to sign and okayed it. And then Dr. Willis, who listened to me for an hour on Sunday. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> so the triple aims of correctional health are um, patient health and safety, population health, and human rights. Um, regarding the patient health and safety, uh, and just the, 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 the brief amount of things I'll say about it, much of which we mentioned with the moving from a four- profit corporation basis into a public health basis. Um, what's required is an independent body, oversight, democratic control, elimination of hierarchy, a healthcare team, stressing team, systematic use of checklists, reliance on standards and best evidence. And those things, for all, all of us who are experienced as working in academic medicine, those things all sound so, of course, but believe it or not, in the majority of US uh, jails and prisons, those things are not in place regarding the health care of the incarcerated. And more than anything, um, patient health and safety, you know, it needs, uh, incarcerated people need physicians who care and who take care of the people. Um, regarding the population health piece, um, an intake at medical intake of any uh, incarcerated person coming into Rikers Island or any of the three facilities. They get vital signs of finger stick, quantifying HIV, hep C, RPR, GCCT in the urine if, if they're male, in the, uh, with a vaginal swab of female, urine drug screen, urine pregnancy. Um, you discuss chronic medical conditions. I really can't say enough uh, substance use and mental health, substance use and mental health, substance use and mental health. I, I thought about while I was there, who knows, maybe I might still do it, becoming a mental health counselor because mental health workers are so needed and it's so understaffed, so really terribly understaffed. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's something that's really needed regarding the care, particularly of this population. Substance use, uh, we started a lot of uh, folks on buprenorphine treatment there. Uh, if they had, if they had experience with methadone, sometimes we discontinued the methadone. Obviously, if they were in like some sort of flagrant alcohol withdrawal, we sent them by 911 to a hospital. The hospital uh, system for folks who are incarcerated in New York City is Bellevue for males and Elmhurst for females. Um, as well as immunizations and ongoing medical care. So whether that was making an appointment with another jail doc, uh, whether that was making an appointment with ID, OBGYN is three times a week at the women's facility. Neurology is somewhere on the island um, Monday through Friday at one of the facilities. There's also a pretty robust transgender care program. I ordered a lot of testosterone, spironolactone, and uh, estrogen, which I wasn't expecting to do. Uh, so at the female uh, facility, you have their incarcerated people who identify as female. You also have transgender men and transgender women all at the uh, female facility. Um, and again, uh, mental health care. So then from medical intake regarding a disposition uh, within the New York City jail system, you can say a person can be in the general population. Uh, you can send them directly to mental health. There's, there's MOs or uh, mental observation units they can be placed in. The infirmary, which I already discussed, medical isolation, uh, and detox or double detox. Uh, again, this is either for very mild, regarding alcohol specifically, it's either very mild alcohol withdrawal uh, and they go on a kind of like benzo taper, or else 
You can call EMS. EMS is like a 911 call, even for Rikers Island. A three-hour run is kind of like if you decide a person probably needs to be in the hospital, but it's not uh, emergent or urgent. Like, for example, a bad cellulitis you think might require IV antibiotics, you can send them on a three-hour run. And urgent care is sort of like the urgent care in the West facility on the island. Um, also, in discussing um, human rights, the human rights piece, of, uh, of, of jail and prison care. Uh, PREA is the Prison Rape Elimination Act. Uh, it was signed in, in 2003. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't see, I mean, it's amazing that it took till 2003 for everyone to say, hey, this should really not be going on. We should be reporting this. But it did happen in 2003. Unfortunately, it hasn't shown, PREA has not shown to necessarily decrease the incidence of sexual assault. Um, and unfortunately, there are more than 77%, seven, sorry, 97%, there's more than 97% of the allegations that have come about because of PREA are pending. So they're just not able to move forward for whatever legal reasons. Um, and so th that leaves just 3% of, of cases that are able to be prosecuted or acted on. Nunes reporting is something that happened in, uh, New, York, in New York City specifically in, uh, in 2015, which brought about, it, it was a, an attempt to bring about a culture change for just like the, the the, the mass use of violence, both uh, between incarcerated people, but also between Department of Corrections and incarcerated people. And it just uh, brought about an obligation to report um, use of force. So an obligation to report use of force anytime, from anyone, anytime that you see it uh, occurring. A dual loyalty is a really uh, central part of prison and jail healthcare. Uh, New York City is progressive, like in a lot of ways, including this one. This is not a part of training for health staff in the majority of places in the US, but it was part of my training uh, before I started. And dual loyalty is a clinical role conflict between professional duties to a patient and the obligations to the interests of a third party, like the security staff. Um, now you can imagine, because most uh, jail and prison healthcare is in the hands of uh, for-profit corporations, the security staff are actually their employer. Um, and so uh, it's, it's an omnipresent predicament, and educators in jail and prison health advocate for, for training of dual loyalty to all staff. Um, I, it's, it's, it's hard to talk about the substance of it uh, if you're not there trying to do your job, trying to take care of someone uh, like presently in action, but I have a couple of like subtle and extreme examples that'll probably drive home the point. More extreme examples are uh, physician participation in lethal injection, for example, which we have a history, physicians have a history of participating in lethal injection. Luckily in New York, uh, we no longer have the death penalty, but still the overwhelming majority of states do have the death penalty. Um, physician assisted torture would also be here as kind of extreme examples. Um, now all the facilities in the New York City jail system still do this thing called quote unquote clearing a patient for solitary confinement. It's been shown again and again and again how, how horrible solitary confinement is for an individual, but still they rely on the medical staff to say that a patient is quote unquote safe to be put in solitary confinement. Luckily, I was not placed in the position where I had to do this. I told one of my preceptors, Dr. Winters, if anyone came to me and asked me to do that, I would absolutely say no. I would make up things that the patient had. I would say anything that I had to say so that they didn't have to go to solitary confinement. He said, okay, okay, Beth, that will handle it. No, no problem. At all. So, um, Another example of dual loyalty is there's this thing called red ID or enhanced restraint status where um, a federal court order requires a medical review of incarcerated people subject to DOC red ID or enhanced restraint, which two examples are like rear cuffs or leg irons. Um, and, and the medical staff are supposed to say whether the restraints are, are physically disabling or have adverse medical consequences. Um, I did have a few of these, and those restraints definitely had adverse medical consequences. But one example is if a person is, has asthma, and they have to have their inhaler in their front pocket, and so then they, they can't be cuffed from the back. Um, another example would be the leg irons only go to a certain uh, width, actually. And so if a person is very... Um, large, if their legs are very large, then that can cause, uh, then that can cause problems. Um, another aspect of, of dual loyalty as an example, and maybe this is more of a, a subtle example, but nonetheless, it was, very, it was very present while I was there. So technically, in terms of the, rule, the rules of the jail, um, you're not, no one is supposed to be having sexual intercourse. But the medical staff gives uh, condoms freely if, if a person asks for them. So we're asked a lot. Uh, from, from a patient coming to the medical clinic for condos, we give them freely. Um, it, it provides some tension 
with the DOC officers because sexual intercourse is not supposed to be occurring. So that's another example of like dual loyalty. So um, just from the UN resolution of the role of health personnel in prisons and jails, um, tasks must be performed with complete loyalty to prisoners. Uh, medical activities not in the interest of prisoners should not be undertaken by professionals who provide health care to prisoners. And just a quote, a, uh, another a quotation from that document is, it is a, a contravention of medical ethics for physicians to be involved in any professional relationship with prisoners or detainees, the purpose of which is not solely to evaluate, protect, or improve their physical and mental health solely to evaluate, protect, or improve their physical and mental health. And so I thought about this a lot coming from this experience. Oh, this is a mural from the women's facility that was made by some of the uh, women there uh, in conjunction with, with an art group. You, this is, I don't know who took this picture because you're not allowed to have any phones or cameras. You check them all at the door. You're not supposed to see anything. So they must have had a big thing in order for someone to get in there and take a picture of this. But anyway, um, <clears throat> OK. So what I wanted to close with is this. So I came from this uh, experience thinking a lot of things, but also in, in being trained in dual loyalty and thinking about this concept of protection, protection of the patient. Because that's an overwhelming thing you feel when you're there, like you have to protect the patient you're trying to care for. And maybe not all of us will work in jail or prison health, but this, this idea of loyalty to the patient and protection of the patient will be involved with as long as we're taking care of patients. So the concept of additional positive regard which is really more than a concept. It's kind of like a, a, a dynamic bedside practice. It was developed by uh, Carl Rogers in 1956, who's one of the fathers of psychotherapy. He worked with a social worker named Jessie Taft. She had worked with an analyst by the name of Otto Renkel, who was a student of Freud. And it was additional, unconditional positive regard is part of the therapeutic relationship, wherein in the context of the provider-patient relationship, the provider constantly sees the patient with hope and belief in his or her healing process. And so it's described as an attitude of grace. Uh, it's an attitude that values the patient without condition, in which judgment is suspended. And the idea that that attitude affects the patient's journey. So how you see the patient will affect his or her journey. Um, and that uh, without condition, meaning that the patient doesn't have to be nice or kind or cute or have a nice family, right? That this applies particularly to those we, we call quote-unquote difficult or quote-unquote manipulative or even quote-unquote insulting. That as providers, we can become mature and self-aware enough to realize that it's not about us, but it's about the patient. So that we can hold anger, we can hold frustration, we can hold insult even, because we don't take it personally and realize it's not about us. And that our seeing the patient with constant hope and respect and dignity is not dependent upon the patient's behaving a certain way. And so unconditional positive regard seeks to make the patient-provider relationship part of the cure. It's a genuine caring that is not dependent on the attitude displayed toward us. And maybe most importantly, that it's a practice, right? That most important thing is that we keep working on it. It's a practice. And as we practice, hopefully we become more and more comfortable realizing that um, professional, appropriately boundary care does not have to be something separate from love. And sometimes that's all we have left after the medications have been administered and the procedures are done. But luckily, love doesn't run out. It's not like IV Valium, right? <laughs> this comes from a, an infinite place. It comes from a constant wellspring. We always have it to give if we're brave enough to give it. Uh, and then probably most importantly that it, it, it just requires that we continue to work on it, that, that we work on it bedside, that it's a clinical bedside practice that we continue to work on. And that's probably what's most important about it. And never forget that justice is what love looks like in public. Thank you. Thank you.